I'm here from uh, ORCID, and I'm uh, going to tell you some stories about things happening in the world of privacy and uh, the efforts of many people to turn you into a product and what you can do about it. So the concept of privacy is something which is actually pretty new. Uh, used to be that there really wasn't any privacy. You lived in villages, and everyone kind of knew your business and knew what you're going. If you want to be private, you literally had to like go away and go into exile, and then you go really private. Um, and uh, so as we started creating societies which were based more around cities and much more tightly coupled interactions, um, the, uh, the idea of privacy started kicking up because people were saying, hey, I've got all these people around me. I need to have some more, um, some more time to myself, some more the ideas of my own information being private. Um, and the internet changed that again. The internet then connected us in a very real way and turned us into more like a global village. But the price of admission to that global village is your privacy, increasingly today. It doesn't have to be this way, but this is essentially how this um, environment has evolved. John Perry Barlow uh, wrote a very interesting piece many years ago, um, essentially a declaration of independence for cyberspace. And that concept of how we were going to build the internet back then uh, has unfortunately not really held true in many of the ways that the internet is working today. Um, back in 95, there were only 16 million people online. And by 2016, we were at 3.4 billion. And in 2016, the United Nations uh, made a resolution where they said that instant access was also a human right, a basic human right. And then by that point in 2019, we have 4.3 billion people online. And those people, all of us, are creating this many bytes of data per day. It's like kind of crazy, right? It's a lot of, a lot of zeros. <laughs> and uh, what kind of stuff is that? Well, it's lots of Instagram, lots of tweets, lots of other stuff, like everything. And tons of this data is just getting recorded. It's like profiles of each of us. It's like the matrix. Like we had this party the other day. Um, really is like the matrix, like we've got, they've, got, they've got you, as if that's the information. And in addition, the internet's not really one internet anymore. Uh, you've got the US, which is extremely heavily corporate controlled and monitored and kind of everything's for free, but the price is you. Uh, you've got Europe, which is kind of a nanny state model of like, we're gonna take care of you, we're gonna make sure you're private, but we're gonna put this GDPR stuff in, which actually has some negative consequences too, that's unintended. Uh, repercussions of what that does. Um, uh, China, we know, um, is extremely heavily censored and controlled. Um, and then in other parts of the world, we're doing experiments where we're just deciding whether we want to turn the internet on and off here and there. Uh, in Russia, um, the last experiment was turning off parts of the internet to stop Telegram being used. Um, Freedom House does a survey uh, every year and a study which tries to determine exactly how private we really are in the world. Um, especially on the internet. It's a very interesting set of studies they do. Um, and their conclusion is it's getting worse. The, the, the idea that the internet's becoming more free and more private is, is just not happening. It's actually getting a lot worse all the time. <coughs> and here's Mark. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so obviously Facebook got in quite a bit of trouble. And so what we're talking right now is the concept of corporate control of the internet, corporate um, control of uh, surveilling you, of censoring you. Um, and one of the unfortunate things right now is just that there is this perception that everything's okay right now. You know, we had the movie, we came with Analytica shut down, like everything we find, but it's the same. There are probably like 20 com companies, coffee cat of Cambridge Analytica, that are gonna do the same thing in the next set of elections, um, probably on both sides this time. And really all that's happening is, is that it's just propaganda. You know, we've finally woken up to the fact that not only are we marketed information for products, we're also marketed information for how to think. And this has been happening for a very long time before the internet, um, and the internet just made it a lot easier to do. So this idea that the things that made the, just life more fun and more convenient have also made it a lot easier to track you. And this is 
from where I'm from originally in England, uh, we have more closed circuit cameras per person than anywhere else in the world. Um, we're really good at this stuff. <laughs> uh, you got nothing on GCHQ. The NSA is just, you know, like a little fun little sister cousin of GCHQ. We got gotcha. you. Um, ironically, my dad actually used to work for GCHQ um, back in the day, so I don't know what that means. Uh, so we don't really want to live this way. We don't want to really you know, live in this world where we have to wall ourselves off and go into exile if we want privacy. We want to live in a world where we're connected and we get to share things with friends. So, uh, but what if you woke up tomorrow and you just couldn't access these sites? What if you were like, oh man, like suddenly my internet just doesn't work? And, and you can do this, by the way, if you just take a plane for two hours west, you can have this experience. It's pretty cheap from here. Um, so, and, and it's pretty hard to work around these, these uh, firewalls and um, restrictions on content. Um, so what do you do? Well, one solution is VPN. And uh, the, <coughs> the challenge of VPNs is that they're not all created equal. Oh, yeah, by the way, this is what we're building. So this is a little bit pitchy, but not 100% pitchy. I'll still like to tell you some good stories. So we're building a decentralized VPN. Um, and we're building it on Ethereum. Come on, on Ethereum, yeah. <laughs> And people ask me why we built it on Ethereum, and I'm like, well, it's the only decentralized smart contract platform. And they're like, well, aren't there some other ones? And I'm like, yeah, but they're not decentralized. So uh, we're doing it with you guys. Um, uh, the VPN market has gone mainstream. So three years ago when we started this uh, company, people were still a little bit like, wow, you really guys going after the privacy space? Do people really care about privacy? Is this a big deal? And then we've had a few interesting events since then which people are starting to realize that it is a big deal. Um, and VPN usage uh, globally has been increasing. Um, there are parts of the world where there's just really heavy restrictions. Um, one strange thing is there are parts of the world where satire is banned. Like, you're not allowed to actually be ironic online. Right? It's like not okay, which I think is really ironic. Um, so not all VPNs are created equal, as I said. Uh, the, the main issue is centralization. So what you're doing with the VPN is you're basically paying someone else to man in the middle attack you. So you're like, hey, here, take all my traffic, and here's some money. They're like, cool, yeah, I can trust you, right? But you don't know, you don't really know whether you can trust them, they might be logging your data. Some of them have prices set so low that they have to have some other business model, and what they do is they sell the data to hedge funds, they sell the data to other people, they, they basically take your information and sell it, just like you were hoping that you were, wouldn't have to happen, like you're trying to get out of that, but actually you're making it worse. Um, so that's one problem, and some of them have uh, logging practices and they say they don't log, and uh, it turns out some of them do, you find out later. Um, it's also a transparency issue. There are in, be, starting to become some of the VPNs now that actually open source their technology. Many of them do use open source standards and uh, toolkits, um, but there's very few of them that just say, here's our code. And the world that we live in, we understand and we believe that this is important. So there is a transparency issue there for sure. Uh, VPNs also have um, typically only well, essentially one connection between you and the VPN and then to the rest of the internet. Um, you can improve the, your protection and your security by actually putting in multiple, essentially multiple relays between you and the ultimate uh, exit site. Um, and that's one of the, the features that we bring in with Orchid. <clears throat> and finally, it's, it's kind of hard to just go up and spin up your own VPN. Um, other techniques such as Tor and other uh, overlay networks most people do this on a volunteer basis. Um, so we've been working on, we believe that having the ability to easily spin up and uh, receive compensation for running uh, nodes in a system like this uh, will be an easy way for us to, to build better VPNs in the future. Um, and finally, most VPNs have, they tend to have a very well-known well -known traffic signature, uh, which means that the firewall is able to easily detect that and filter the information out. Uh, we've been working on a, a solution to fix that. Um, so this is the pitch piece. We're offering a better VPN. Um, it's open source. It's built on Ethereum. Right? <laughs> it's secure uh, and it's decentralized. And we're launching this year. Uh, so we'll be launching in December. You guys can write that down if you like. Um, and uh, um, we're launching a mobile client first, 
um, primary mobile client as our focus. Uh, we're partnering with a number of um, bigger players in the space and also in the VPN space. Um, and we're hoping to try and address a number of the issues that we've found in the space of VPNs and in privacy. Uh, we have an internal roadmap where we're going to be improving upon these things and uh, increasing the amount of um, not only knowledge that we're sharing about this, but the kind of tools that we're building to improve your privacy. And I think I'm a little early, but, uh, oh yeah, this final thing. So we think it's time for privacy, which is a pretty big market, and the crypto market to join forces. And we hope that in the future, um, not just ourselves, but other people will be inspired to look at um, this industry and these spaces of private communication and use uh, the kind of all the brains and resources we have in this community uh, to work on these problems together. Thank you.